here and to okay so yeah it's good to be here to maybe get your your expert feedback on, on kind of what we're doing um there are two strands to the research we're going to present today, but both have a common interest in the role that ICT can play in supporting just and sustainable transitions and both engage in methods and matters of featuring for social change in different ways. So the first, Share City, focuses on ICT mediated urban food sharing, its practices and potential to reconfigure urban food systems towards more sustainable pathways. And today we'll be concentrating on one element of this project, which trialed visualizations of alternative scenarios for urban food sharing as an alternative means to engage hard to reach stakeholders. The second, which I'll do very briefly because we may not have much time, is exploring the impact of engaging marginalized voices in climate change adaptation planning through the development of a platform with online resources uh, and a serious game. Um, and both projects are very much team efforts. Let me see if I can... Uh, So to begin with, uh, Shersti, this project was born from the findings of previous research examining practices of sustainable household food consumption in a project called Consensus, which pushed back against an encroaching individualism around food consumption policy and flagged the importance of collective acts around food, both as actual and promising practices for more sustainable food systems. Uh, the practice-oriented backcasting methodology and the living laboratory work that Consensus developed inspired the structure and conceptual framing of Shersti, which combines social practice approaches with insights from diverse economies and transitions research. So in Shersti, the focus was narrowed to consider practices of ICT-mediated food sharing and broadened to move beyond the home focus uh, and to focus on sharing within communities of place and practice. And Shersti also focuses not just on matters of sustainable consumption, but also sustainable production and disposal, representing the reality that food sharing occurs across the food system. As this body of food sharing activity had not been mapped before, this was the goal of the first stage of our research. And we spent five months collating more than 4,000 food sharing initiatives with active websites, apps, and interactive social media in 100 areas where, worldwide. And we coded and sorted the initiatives and created like an open space open access interactive searchable database, uh, which has now been viewed more than 17,000 times from 93 countries. And this mapping provided a sample population from which we identified sites for more in-depth research with initiatives and wider stakeholders in particular locations. And nine cities were explored in depth and case study initiatives from across key activities of growing, cooking, eating and redistributing food were examined through participation in acts of food sharing both on and offline and through interviews and workshops with wider stakeholders. And this research formed the foundation for two further activities. First, the examination of sustainability impacts, which led to the co-production of an online sustainability impact assessment toolkit called Share It. And second, consideration of the impact of policy and governance on the future, the food sharing activities. And we're still working on these last activities in post-share city funded research. And Louise will be taking you through one element of this in a minute. It's hard to design an exit strategy for a research project such as Shersti that's raised as many questions as answers and in an arena where activities, policies and contexts were constantly evolving even before COVID-19. But I was keen to try and consolidate findings in a way which was digestible and the manifesto for sustainable food sharing shown on this slide is my first attempt to do that. So you might say, why a manifesto? Well, we know that manifestos take many forms and are typically used in a political context and Share City has identified the highly political nature of and surrounding context for food sharing. However, this manifesto is not a blueprint or a doctrine for food sharing initiatives, but a wider set of interconnected high level principles that underpin the most holistically sustainable practices of food sharing we encountered. It's been developed as a means to engage not just food sharers, but also those who interact with and govern them. Yeah. So the manifesto is really a living document, a communication device, a means to consolidate, represent diverse work with each element linked to project outputs. It's a springboard, really, to stimulate further engagement, critique, research and action. And the tentative answer to the question, what do you believe, based on years of empirical research working with food sharing? It's important to note that not all these principles can be enacted by food sharing initiatives alone. Many require the interaction of a wide range of actors. 
So food sharing cannot be connected, for example, without others to connect with, and it can't be embedded without a community to be embedded within. So out of the baker's dozen sustainable food sharing principles, one emerged from our research around fruit chewing that are being supported. That is working with governments that respect and support the values that sustainable sharing creates. And this may seem like a truism to flag this principle, but it's a fundamental nature which demands it's included in the manifesto. And it emerges as a recurrent theme through a range of research settings from mapping to featuring exercises. So in the mapping phase, we found a concentration of active and persistent food sharing initiatives in settings where local governments are committed to sustainability in a range of different ways, maybe being a member of an international alliance, such as the Sharing Cities Network or the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, or where local authorities had progressive stance on food policy, perhaps through the development of food policy councils or similar initiatives. In the Collaborative Sharing Futures workshop, we conducted international stakeholders from policy, academia and practice, all flagged the challenges of trying to enact sustainable food sharing of any kind in the absence of a supportive governing context, and in particular supported policies around space and place. So land use planning policy and implementation were specifically called out for their pivotal role in allocating land and facilities for sharing activities with participants flagging the pervasive nature and negative impacts of insecure tenure that food sharing initiatives often were allocated, if they were lucky enough to be allocated any space at all. And despite visible levels of under occupancy and vacancy in all the cities we imagined, we examined. However, while policy was a major barrier, it was hard to engage policymakers about this, mainly because few local authorities are progressive enough to have food policy officers in place. And this stimulated us to develop alternative modes of engagement. And, and Louise is now going to take you through these uh, and what we've done with them. So I'm just going to stop sharing so that Louise can share her file. Great, thank you. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, it should be working. Great. Hopefully. Can you see this okay? Yeah, okay, great. So yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, great to be here. So as Anna said, growing out of this work um, as a new means to engage, um, Share City embarked on its futuring work. And just to practice or to give you an overview of what um, Share City did, um, we developed uh, scenarios of possible futures, so different scenarios um, of what the future could look like for food sharing, urban food sharing in 2050. And we visualized these in collaboration with an artist as a, a novel means or a new means of engagement on issues of sustainability. And we then used these visualizations, as Anna has also um, described, to facilitate dialogue and reflection on issues within current approaches to, to sustainable futures. So what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? How might we do things differently based on looking at alternative visions of what the future could look like? So just to reflect a bit and um, before I share the work on the purpose of Share City's futuring work. Firstly, um, there was an aim to destabilize the view that futuring, so really futuring there meaning just a means of systematically thinking about and approaching the future is an elite activity led by industrialists or corporate actors and technology driven rather than everyday citizens. So really conventional and traditional approaches often um, highlight the importance of technology change or are driven by corporate actors and are quite exclusionary. And we wanted to show rather that it's everyday citizens who engage um, in, in futuring and who are already creating um, future alternatives. Secondly, um, as I mentioned, and as Anna mentioned, it was um, an attempt to develop a new means of engaging differently uh, with policymakers. So moving away from, you know, maybe a long report, which is criticizing what's being done by policymakers to rather uh, trying to, to make a new way of engaging with them through these visualizations. And then finally, it was an attempt to, um, to engage in more inclusive futuring approaches. So elevating and including marginalized perspectives. And there was two ways that we aim to do that. Firstly, the images, like you, as you'll see very shortly, um, they really elevate the perspectives of food sharers who, as Anna said, often aren't engaged with by policymakers, are often marginalized and not supported. And in these images, they really come to the fore, particularly in the image of uh, the desirable future and the role food sharers could play. 
And secondly, as Anna said, through engaging with um, certain groups of people, um, including young people, um, on issues of sustainable future. And we've also done some work and I'll share that shortly. But uh, before that, I'd just like to share with you our um, visualizations that we developed with the artist. So here we have the first visualization um, of what the future of food sharing could look like in 2050. We see um, this is essentially a scenario, um, we call it the, the business as usual scenario, where um, issues that are going on for food shares now have continued into the future. So there's some food sharing going on, as you can see, some community growing, um, but it's, it's essentially struggling under the existing regulatory environment. Um, and there's many of the challenges that we see in our urban spaces today, but also citizens um, advocating for change. But uh, a city hall that's that's kind of barriered and, and quite difficult to, to engage with. Um, but these are all on our website if you want to explore them further. Of course, there's, there's a, a lot to them. So here's our second um, scenario of what the future could look like for food sharing. And here you see there's lots of food sharing going on. Um, there's many different people participating in diverse food sharing activities from community gardening to the kitchen hub to the community orchard in the background. Um, and really, this is a much more uh, convivial, inclusive uh, food system with food sharing and food sharers playing a really central role in this. And in the center at the back here, we can see um, the city hall that's open. There's the mayor working with, uh, with citizens on important issues. And the idea really here is that, as Anna was talking about, there's a supportive um, urban planning and, uh, and policy system in place that allows then food sharing to flourish and to just to um, achieve all of its uh, sustainable and well-being um, and justice benefits that it already does um, to the food system. So this is our desirable future of what the food uh, system could look like into the future. And finally, here's the third, uh, the third scenario of the future. Um, and this is what we would call the ecological modernization or the technical fix where really these corporate and technology driven changes have been prioritized. And um, while the more social dimension or the social justice dimension has been neglected in policy and planning and um, in dealing with the sustainable sustainability issue so. There's uh, things like a vertical farm so technology driven solutions private solutions and um, to growing food. There's um, a food justice truck, so people um, queuing up to, to receive food, so, so clearly people struggling in this scenario. There's some food sharing, but it's um, elite and it's you pay for it rather than it being an open um, thing that anyone can benefit from. Um, so really this driven, technology driven and corporate driven um, sustainability solutions. And again, like I said, these are on our website for you to explore further, sharecity.ie. So just to share now how we've been using this work and the piloting work we've been doing. Um, firstly, we, as Anna said, we're seeking to engage with, with different groups and within the Share City Futuring work, we also piloted youth engagement. So what we did was we ran workshops um, with 15 to 16 year olds in a local school. We ran two workshops with them. In the first workshop, we shared um, what food sharing was with them um, in its various forms, how it can take shape and talk to them about issues of justice and sustainability in our current food system. We then shared with them the image of the, um, of the desirable future, the much more diverse and inclusive future that you saw as the second one, um, and invited them then to write um, a piece of flash fiction, so 500 words, on a day in the life in this desirable future. So imagining themselves going about their day-to-day -day life, what would they get up to um, in this desirable future? And we also conducted pre and post workshop surveys to try and assess the, the impact um, of participating in these workshops and participating in the, in the writing competition. So just to share with you um, some findings from those, from those, uh, from those surveys, so the pre-workshop survey, we asked them to name three words that come to mind when they think of the future of food in cities. And here you see a word cloud of it. So we have words like, you know, we have some organic, uh, vegan, okay, but we also have fancy, condensed, futuristic drones, laboratories, artificial technology, plastic made. So very technical, uh, technological driven imaginaries of the future. 
And that contrasted quite strongly with our post workshop survey when we asked them again to name um, three words that come to mind. And there we have community coming through really strong. So we still have robots, so still some hints of technology, but also sustainable, accessible, sharing, abundant. And um, so for us, this was really interesting to see that even those students who didn't engage in the writing competition, but only engaged in the work workshops themselves, that their imaginaries of what the and the possibilities of what the future of food could look like in cities really changed and shifted to be much more um, sharing and community based based on their engagement with the workshop. So that was a very um, positive uh, finding for us. And just to share now briefly um, about the other part of the work we've been doing with these visualizations, which is the piloting po um, policy engagement. So uh, I think it was last week already we had a workshop with policymakers at city, city council level where we showed them all three scenarios and we used that as a means to start conversation on issues of sustainability that the city was facing. And so just to share some reflections on, on this and our experience of running the workshop with them, which was for um, one and a half hours, the scenario images um, proved useful and um, certainly in opening up discussion of fundamental issues. So things like the dominance of market based approaches and minimal engagement with um, with citizens were discussed. So it really proved a good launching pad for opening up these discussions. Uh, policymakers, when they looked at the images, really recognized elements of the future of the present that they could see. So they could see how these futures could possibly um, come come into being based on what they see around them in their work. So that was quite interesting, and that they were able to relate to them in that way. And finally, within the workshop themselves, itself, there was positive exchange amongst policymakers. So they talked about the issues and they talked about potential solutions and getting in touch with one another. And this was also kind of quite interesting for us in terms of how these interventions and, and just holding this space for these people to come together and discuss issues in this way that's not conflict driven, but it's rather opening up and thinking about the future and, and as a means to just say, okay, how could things be different? What are the challenges we face? What are the opportunities we have? And maybe actually quite beneficial for, our, for hoping to uh, identify solutions. Um, so I think that's my section. So I'll give back to Anna. Thanks, Louise. Do you want me I'll to just share, or you want to share? Um, I'll share. I'll share the okay. screen. But if you, if you could just be in the background there, I'm going to um, see if I can. Sorry, just flicking through here. Just going to show you a video. So, so yeah, as Louise said, that work is is ongoing in terms of futuring, and with the, with the flash fiction workshop that uh, that that Louise ran with the students, we did get uh, some submissions which were really interesting and really diverse. And, and maybe we can talk a bit more about those if there are questions about that afterwards, because. Uh, the level of engagement was a bit disappointing. It was uh, the timing was at the end of, of the school year, and and this is a transition year cohort in in Ireland, which means they're 15, 16, and they they have a kind of easy year where they do sort of extracurricular activities, and that's why we were able to uh, engage them with with this activity because otherwise they're they're very much focused on the curriculum that they're going to be examined on. But it gives gives us that space to engage with this cohort. Um, and yeah, the stories that they did write, who did submit to our competition were really interesting and really diverse. Um, and, you know, we, we'd be interested in potentially doing more of that down the line. So in another project that I'm working on with Stefan Hugel here in Trinity is Climate Smart, which is funded by Science Foundation Ireland and supported by the Enable Research Spoke. And we're looking at the citizen engagement component of that. And in Climate Smart, we're very much interested in adaptation and increasing engagement in adaptation planning. Um, and we, we've done a range of activities, but what we're currently working on is uh, a serious game on an online platform. We've been doing face-to-face -face workshops before COVID. COVID stimulated us to put this online in terms of resources, but I think also that assists in making materials what more widely available for, for other schools to engage with them. So it was a good push for us. Uh, and in the last six months, we've been developing a serious game, which is the culmination of these um, research workshops. So in, in a school setting, the students would follow the workshops, which are a set of videos and quizzes um, on a range of these five topics that can be seen on this screen here. And there are points for discussion with the teacher and clarification 
and quizzes that they're supposed to pass before they can get to the game. However, we're also interested in seeing whether the game component can be played autonomously in the absence of doing the workshops and therefore whether the game itself might have wider application to broader uh, sections of community as well. And we developed a teaser of the game because it's hard to show a game in a slide format. I'm going to try and do it. And if I don't, then you might be able to help me out with a, a YouTube link. But let, let's have a go. I'm going to click and see if it works. You need to tell me if uh, you're seeing. And while that loads, you've just got about two more minutes as well, if that's OK. Yeah. Doesn't look like it's working on my screen. If you put the YouTube link in the chat, maybe I can try. Sorry, are you, are you not seeing that? No. no. Okay, let oh, me, I'll stop maybe sharing. Cl close your, if you close this screen and you share again um, the YouTube video, it might come up. Yes, no, Louise, you want to me to try? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So it was playing for me, but no one else was, was getting it. Yeah, I think you have to switch the presenter view. Okay. Uh, there we go. There we go. Just have to turn on uh, where's chair. It's only a minute, so Claire, I won't, I won't be long. Share computer sign. Okay. It's the year 2045, and you are the newly elected mayor of Dublin. The city is at higher risk of flooding than ever before because of climate change. Your task is to address these risks and protect the city and its citizens by 2050. Each year, you must create, consult on, and implement a climate adaptation plan. Select from a range of flood defences, nature-based solutions, policies, and public engagement strategies to build your plan. Use the interactive map to explore where your defences are located. You can zoom, pan, or tilt the map. Are you protecting all your citizens equally? You have a limited budget, so choose wisely. And remember, not everyone will be in favour of your changes. Make too many unpopular choices and you will get kicked out of office. But don't worry, in each round you'll receive expert feedback to guide you and get a chance to revise your plan. What you can't predict is the size and nature of the annual flood event. You have five years to defend the city. Will you be climate smart? Good luck. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. So that's a little teaser to the game. I think that shows quite nicely um, the, the elements of it in a dynamic form. So just to have the last... Yeah. Sorry. I'm gonna stop sharing there. Maybe I'll, 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 I won't share my screen again, but just to say, to, to, to wrap up, but we certainly face sort of major challenges in relation to, to the relation to food and climate change and indeed to the intersections between them. Um, so there's much reason for despair, I suppose, even grief. And this is something that we were concerned about in relation to young people as well, in relation to climate change and food. And as Leslie Head's pivotal book, Hope and Grief in the Anthropocene, sets out really well on the plus side, such despair might even engender collective capacities and mobilise newfound resources, but grief alone is clearly insufficient. So it's vital to also create spaces for hope, not through kind of empty promises of optimism, which ask us to have faith in the future, but rather that we seek out and enact a keeping going kind of hope. Um, and this form of hope is both a, a disposition to the world and a set of practices to be exercised and experienced and, and from which necessary dis disappointments also will flow. And we like to think both the Share City visualization methodology and the Climate Smart Game offer spaces for experimenting with doing things differently and therefore providing spaces of hope for the future amongst those who engage through them. Uh, so there is hope in the sense of there being potential for things to be otherwise. Um, so yeah, I believe in tomorrow and I'm ready to, to keep going here to, to see what we can do to create more positive futures. So I think that's it for now and hopefully we're keeping a bit of time there. Ab, thanks ever so much, Louise and Anna. That was so interesting and such beautiful uh, graphics and visualizations and games. Um, so we've just a few minutes for any clarifying type questions or short questions that anybody has. You can either wave your physical hand you can raise your virtual hand or stick a cue in the chat and I'll come to you if you've not got a microphone and you need a question asking on your behalf just type it into the chat and I can do that too 
Anyone want to kick us off? Go on, Ali. And then we've got one back off. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. Um, and I love the I love the visualizations, and that's what my question is about. So the process of visualizing those four, I think it was four, sorry, creatures with the artists were um, were those images also developed in like a sort of co-productive way with pay, you know, the, the citizens that you were engaging with, or was that something that you worked on directly with the artists based on the sort of workshop? Um, results. I'm just quite curious about that actual process of visualization. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So it was based on the the years of work running up to the Sharing Futures workshop, and the Sharing Futures workshop included food sharing initiatives, um, academics working on food sharing issues, and policy shapers. So we had invited policymakers to that workshop. Um, as it turned out, many of those who turned up weren't necessarily local authority policymakers, and this was part of our motivation to try an alternative means of engagement, particularly in contexts such as, as Ireland, where none of the local authorities have a food policy council, none have a food policy officer, none have any structures which find, uh, collectively address food. Um, so we were finding that people didn't see these food issues as their core business and were struggling to prioritise that in terms of engaging with uh, workshops, even if they had said that they would attend, then something more important came up uh, just before the events. So that's really motivated us to do these kind of visualisations. And although the co-design work was between us as researchers and the artist, and, and that in itself was an interesting experience, and we can talk about more about that if anyone wants to find out more. Um, but yeah, the, the data behind the scenarios was co-designed with a, a range of different stakeholders, including food sharing initiatives, but not um, everyday folk, not everyday citizens. So that's why we were interested to see how people in um, school and in policymakers would, would receive them. Uh, thanks, and a question from Jacko. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Anna and Louisa, for very uh, inspiring and pre presentations. Uh, I, I liked it a lot, but it also raised uh, at least two what well, two questions for me. Is one is that that say what you show is that what well, this kind of approach is very well done. Uh, say uh, help a lot in in say capacity building and bringing these topics further. Uh, but I was wondering, what do you then see as as, as say that confirms what we more or less know about that? What would you see as the say key scientific challenges that we still have to figure out uh, about these kinds of processes. And I've also a bit of more a more content-related question, that is, say, uh, well, uh, having worked on, on these kinds of topics on, on food, local food and food consumption for, for the last 20 years and a bit, I, I still see many similarities by the kind of uh, scenarios we, where, that were developed that, at that time. And the ones that you are showing now, well, okay, the terms get a bit different. We now call that vertical farming. Uh, but, but, but say the, the basic key elements are, are still, in my view, uh, pretty similar. And say, well, would you, uh, my request is to share your thoughts on that, how in terms of topic, topical we, we, we might progress or how that has evolved over the last, over the past decades. Thanks, Yako. Yeah, just to answer your second one, maybe first. Um, no, I agree. It's natural or sort of ending with the hope and grief type of thing, because it's a little bit despairing to see the lack of development and progression in some areas. Um, I think what, what the workshop with policymakers really illustrated was the inertia created by infrastructures, departmentalism within local authorities and the inability for individual actors in spite of their interest in progressing more sustainable or experimental type activities really struggled to navigate the structures of the local authority to have that impact. So um, everyone who participated in the policy workshop with us expressed the desire to do things differently, but struggled themselves despite working in the local authority to know how they could make that difference given the structures and the departmental and role responsibilities that they're allocated with. Um, and fundamentally underpinning all of that is that the key driver for the local authority is extracting value from the land and under the current, current kind of conventions around what is valuable, uh, 
what is valuable in terms of land space, for example, just to take one case where a lot often community gardens are on meanwhile leases, insecure tenure, uh, that's because they're seen as an amenity by the local authority that can have this temporary use um, while they're looking for a more valuable use for that land. And when those situations change or buyers come up, then that land, which they argue in the development plan has been already zoned for housing or industrial development or whatever, can then be uh, reclaimed for them. So it's the marginalization of the value of these kinds of activities because of their lack of um, at least perceived financial value um, and the underplaying of the other forms of value that we've identified that they create for social cohesion, combating loneliness, increasing well-being, creating more biodiverse urban environments, creating uh, mechanisms to help uh, people to address issues around food waste reduction and uh, increasing healthy diets. So I think that there are a couple of issues there, the pervasing neoliberal kind of environment that local authorities are operating in. Um, and secondly, the, the, the structural infrastructures of local government and the way that makes it hard to navigate change, even if there's a desire to do so. So I think that's, that's, that's an exp explanation to that. I don't know, Louise, if you wanted to say anything else about that one. Yeah, I think Anna, exactly. Um, I think the key message is value and what's valued and what isn't valued. And I think unless that a fundamental shift happens there, I think we're probably going to continue to have the same challenges. So um, your first question was on scientific challenges. Did, did you want to come in on that, Anna, the first question? No, you go ahead. I forgot what the first question was now. So you okay. can... Um, yeah, sorry. Were you meaning the scientific challenges in the process of understanding whether it's... Um, impactful or what was your query exactly on no, I, I was actually looking for say well we know that that say these issues say so it's like implementation of, of governance issues and we, we know about that these kind of processes uh, are very helpful for capacity building and to move these things further but what would be like the scientific challenges ahead and what, what are still the uh where we need more knowledge on to bring this further. Uh, if we know these things of that, that well, now we know much more about the pros and cons of these kinds of processes. Processes as in futuring processes? Yeah. Or, yeah. And using that for capacity building and as a part of, of change processes. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in the context of what we were doing, it was really just a desire to share the experiences of food shares, which are so often overlooked by policymakers. So for us, that was kind of, maybe it was a discrete intervention in the context of you know, larger issues, but it was really focusing on food sharing. And for us then, it was like sensitizing them to the fact that food sharing exists, what the struggles are, how we might change things into the future. And, and because like Anna said, this was based exactly on the data of what food sharers had shared that they face in terms of policy challenges. Um, it was just really a way to bring that to the policymakers um, and yeah, to share with them this data in a novel way. So they maybe don't know what's actually happening, but what's happening is we're saying, this is what food shares are facing. This is what has to change to make them be able to play a larger role in dealing with sustainable and justice issues in food systems, which they already do. So it is scientific, it's empirical. We can see that they already do it. And these are also empirically what they've told us would need to change if they, um, want to be able to do their work into the future and um, so so within that that's how it was scientific for us because it was based on empirical data and um, but the larger futuring within things like the UN and, and things like that I, I wouldn't be able to offer an answer onto those broader processes but within ours yeah it was based definitely a scientific uh, process to that okay so thank you again Louise and Anna and thanks uh Chaco and Ali for the questions. So we will move now to Marlene and Orlane's um, talk. And if it's all right, Charlotte, Stephen will save your questions for the end. So do, do please make yourself a note or sort of cement it in your brains and we'll come to you first in the next session. Um, hi, everybody. And uh, well, I, I hope you can see our screen. Uh, we're presenting a talk that we presented recently at the European Sociological Association. So it might be familiar. I think Charlotte was there. Uh, so I'm Marlene Sahakin and I'm here with Orlan Moina. And you'll see that we're not as advanced as 
Anna and Louise, but we were sort of exploring the same or using the same uh, methodology. So um, our interest with a project that started about a year ago here in Switzerland is to think about how citizens can be engaged in an energy transition and adapt to the climate crisis. Um, and the idea we had was to create narratives based on what would be preferable and possible energy sufficiency futures, engage whether people today see these futures as desirable. And our idea of desirable draws on Ian Goff's notion of sustainable well being, which means both meeting human needs and um, considering environmental limits. So, very much similar to that. Uh, a donut that we saw appear in one of the, the cartoons uh, that uh, Anna and Louise presented. So what did we not want to do in imagining the future? We didn't want to present an easy silver bullet uh, solution. We also wanted to go beyond uh, technocentric imaginaries. This is a picture I took at a, a museum in Copenhagen where children were asked to imagine the future. And of course, you always have these flying cars and um, automated, what is this, an automated hand that cleans. <laughs> Um, so we didn't want technological solutions to save the day. We didn't want only individual actions to prevail. We didn't want solely market-based solutions. Uh, and we didn't want to be too prescriptive, but this is a big question that we have. So this will come back to that at the end of the presentation. What we did want to include was 2035 as a date that people can imagine, not too far off, not too near. Not too near. We took... Um, specifically took energy sufficiency principles into account. So there's a megawatt scenario for Switzerland to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And that's the scenario that we uh, engage with. We'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, we realized that even if we represented an individual living in the future and that individual is engaged in a series of practices, we wanted to make sure that the collective forms of change that precede, precede any individual action are made explicit. Um, we wanted to bring in complexity, so accounting for systems of practices, interrelations, and also trade-offs. Diversity was central. Whilst we looked at um, um, the, the existing demographics for Geneva and tried to imagine what they would be um, projected to in 2035, we did want to represent diversity in terms of uh, people living in this future. And uh, we heard a very nice talk at the ECEEE conference um, earlier in the summer about an ecosystem of narratives and personas. And that's really what we were trying to achieve. So not just one image, not one um, person living in the future, but many different um, images of the future. So what we're gonna do today is just go through the overview of the methodology. We're running our first workshop um, mid-October, so we're not as far advanced as uh, Anna and Louise. So here we wanted to show how we went from energy scenarios to narratives that represent a vision of the future and then to personas. Yes, so as uh, Malin said, we try to go from, uh, some, from energy scenarios to uh, everyday practices and to uh, narratives. And for doing that, we selected uh, specific scenarios that were relevant for our concerns. And, and for the, the sufficiency approach we want to have. So we selected the Swiss megawatt scenarios, which is called the scenario of uh, energy transition 2050. And that accounts for uh, sufficiency at the Swiss level. Uh, and megawatt considers the three pillars of efficiency, renewables and sufficiency, but, but mostly focused on uh, sufficiency. So that's why uh, we selected that. And as this one didn't cover every, uh, every consumption domains we wanted to address, we completed it by uh, other additional scenarios, uh, including the uh, global one, the decent living uh, energy 2050 from Milward and Hopkins, and uh, also Milward Hopkins and Al, also uh, the U EU 1.5 life scenario, um, and finally the spread sustainable lifestyle uh, 2050. And so, based on those scenarios, uh, focusing mostly, analyzing mostly the megawatt, but also the other ones, we selected uh, um, a number of work-life assumptions uh, that are um, embedded in specific work-life categories that we considered. So one of them is more overarching. Another one is about eating and cooling, warm water, electricity, there's one on food, leisure, mobility and transport, and also one on working. And to give you a, a kind of an overview and an example of uh, the assumptions, we selected from those scenarios, for example, it is one from eating about uh, reducing effective indoor temperatures to 20 degrees 
uh, uh, in winter, and also about food that can be uh, drastically reduced, the assumption about drastically reduced animal-based products, for example. And so then based, based on those assumptions we selected from the scenarios, we linked it to uh, everyday practices as a, a way to situate energy use in everyday practices of the future. And so, for example, linked to the eating and cooling assumption I just mentioned, we selected from the Negawatt scenario, we link it to uh, the practice of keeping bodies, human and non-human, warm in spaces uh, during the winter. And in relation to food, for example, this can be uh, the practices of provisioning for preparing and eating plant-based uh, diets every day. So uh, while we try and engage with a social practice approach, I should say one of our hypotheses starting out was that energy scenarios remain very abstract for citizens. So imagining practices in the future was our way of making those energy scenarios more relatable. Uh, and so we wanted to describe them in all of their complexity regarding material arrangements, skills, competencies, and meanings. Uh, but we also wanted to show how um, uh, certain practices have to precede the sustainable sufficiency practice that we were describing. So how would food retailing change, building design change, workplace time management change? So here we're sort of already uh, doing a little bit of backcasting, I would say. So not only imagining narratives and scenarios from the future, but doing a little bit of backcasting based on our knowledge of uh, the literature on um, uh, transitions, on you know, drawing from degrowth, drawing from a lot of other sources to think of the hope hopeful changes that might need to take place to support these uh, sufficiency lifestyles. So for example, um, yeah, for the heating and cooling um, category, we would want to um, achieve well-isolated buildings, but also changing expectations around comfort. Um, for food, it related to uh, changing systems of provision around uh, having self-service stations for healthy food, for example, but also new expectations around meals and special occasions. So taking into consideration practices that sort of preceded the act of consumption sufficiency. And so, yeah, then based on all that, on the assumptions, the practices we link to it and the elements of practices also that support, will support those practices uh, in the future, we are in the process of designing um, a, a number of personas that will be uh, representative of the population in Geneva, but also that can be relatable to people and that will help us uh, um, make scenarios from the future relatable to uh, everyday people and citizens. And so we created a few personas with a, sh a short description of them that is uh, that explains who they are, what the job is and what they mainly do. And then we also use a, a longer description that really details um, all of the, uh, the, the everyday practice and their daily life. And, and it's important to note that we um, we attributed one kind of one life, uh, working life domain to each, to every, in each, each and every uh, persona. So for example, he we tell the story of Thomas, um, and and this one, he, this doing doing this uh, while uh, concentrating on the the work his working life and the fact that he reduces, for example, working hours. And here in Bonn, you have the maybe most important points of this long description. So about you know maybe a law that uh, requires short, shorter hours and that allow Thomas to uh, have free time to uh, care for his uh, young children and also cook good quality food for them and all that. So we're trying to really tell a story here uh, that won't be relatable to people and that uh, <coughs> yeah, will help us during the workshops as well. Yeah, so there will be a total of eight to 10 um, personas when we're, when we're done with this process. Uh, so the next, uh, what I was describing earlier is that we've sort of brought in social change initiatives and in the systems of provision approach. So we looked at existing literature uh, and also we'll now be doing consultations with our advisory committee and um, other actors involved in the energy transition in Switzerland to see whether we've really taken into account the change initiatives that would need to be put into place for these future personas to be living in our desirable 2035. 
Um, so like I said, we're going to be testing these personas now with different audiences and just in listening to Anna's presentation and the comments, you know, maybe they can also react to the images and suggest changes to the images, suggest changes to the narratives that we're describing. And all of this, you know, perfecting the personas, the narratives and these stories will lead up to um, will culminate with two workshops in the spring in two cities uh, in Switzerland. So the expected outcome is that people are able to imagine energy sufficient scenarios that lead to, lead to sustainable well-being. So what do we mean by that? Uh, it's sort of um, the, the well-being component has not come in yet. It'll be coming in in the spring workshops. We want to we want to know whether people can relate to these personas. And if they can, uh, then um, say something about how these future per personas relate to well-being understood as the need to feel free in society, to feel protected, to have a contact with nature, et cetera, et cetera. So that will come next. Some of the limits to our approach, and this is a question I had in looking at Louise and uh, Anna's slides, it's that in essence, we are giving a utopic uh, idea of a desire, desire, desirable future. And um, you know, even in, in uh, the three scenarios that we saw earlier, I mean, those are, you know, the, the modernity, the, the, the technological optimism one was decidedly less utopic, let's say, than the sharing communal one. And I have, I don't know, I have a bit of an issue with that in our own work, because I wonder to what extent we can imagine the future as being so perfect. Shouldn't it also be messy, uh, a little rough around the edges and, and a bit more complex? So that's a question that we're posing ourselves. Clearly in the project, we have a bias towards energy related issues. I don't know that we can uh, overcome that. We're funded by the Federal Office of Energy. So that's what they're interested in. And then uh, there's a question about the length of these persona descriptions and associated images. We're not sure you know, how much is enough. This is something we really have to test and see um, how people react to relate to them. So that's it from us. Thanks very much. Lovely, fabulous. Um, have we got a couple of quick questions for Olena and Marley? And then we'll move to a kind of general conversation with everyone. Mary, are you gearing up for a question there? Yeah, I was looking for the raise the hand there. But I think <laughs> I just, um, yeah, thanks a million for your really interesting talk. Um, it was just a simple question around the production of these uh, images, kind of building on what Ali said before. Um, I saw, I mentioned a student who had um, um, com or produced the image. So if you could take it a, a little bit through how that process played out. Yes, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's still very experimental. Last in 2020, a bachelor student in my class uh, created characters for um, a teaching approach, approach I use called the theoretical theater that builds on Jill Seyfang's work. So she had personified some conceptual approaches in my class. And since then, I've been, you know, in contact with her. And so we brought her into this project and have been, you know, working with her, meeting with her, talking through the, the personas and having her illustrate them. For us, it's still just a first attempt. And I took a lot from Anna and Louise's presentation in terms of how those images might then be submitted to maybe even um, other um, uh, why not ask the people in our workshop to comment on the images and see if they would change them or how they relate to them, et cetera. So it's still very much uh, a work in progress. And at the end, will we just have text? Will we have little videos? Will we have cartoons? Will we have images? One thing uh, I heard, because we have a partner uh, here that will be exhibiting some of these images uh, in um, a global, uh, an exhibition called Global Happiness. It's really global well-being, but they called it Global Happiness. And they told us, make sure the images are not too cartoony. Uh, they should be relatable and they should, um, what did they ask us? Uh, they should make people smile, like people should, you know, kind of like them and, and have a warm feeling towards them. But if they're too cartoony, then you might lose people. So we're still trying to figure out the right balance there. Okay, thanks. It's really interesting. Love to follow the process. <clears throat> and Ali, a question from you. Um, I asked a question last time, so if anyone else wants to go, please do. No. Okay. Um, thank you. It's so fascinating. So my 
my question comes from a genuine place of curiosity. Um, I don't want it to seem critical. I just wondered what the decision-making process was in terms of personifying in terms of like an individual vignette versus kind of representing futures of say systems of practices. Like what was the, what was that choice? Because I can imagine they both do quite different things. Um, like I really get that argument of yeah. sort of people being able to vision themselves in the future. And, and, and but I think that does that come at some, some cost um, in terms of communicating sort of theoretical conceptual shifts within government and policy? Sorry, it's a bit of a tricky yeah. one. <laughs> No, no, it's a very um, good question. And as I said, it's not, yeah. it's not a, it's not a critique. It's a genuine, like what, like yeah. for this community, like what's the risks and benefits of doing that? Absolutely, and I've seen, we, I've seen this, this done, and and I have not been convinced by how it's been done in the past. So I don't know why we're setting ourselves this challenge of trying to do it convincingly, but but we do have an answer to that. It's that. I'm, I am very convinced by role-playing approaches. And the goal for the spring workshops is for, is for groups of people to take on a persona. And then when they take on that persona, um, they will then be asked to uh, um, answer a series of questions or discuss a series of points. So we needed those personas in a way to make sure people could uh, take on a take on a different character and engage in role playing, which we, we really wanted role playing to be the methodology. But uh, how how to get there and are the images to uh, in, in sort of individualize and not practice space? It's true. Every time we try to show someone doing something in the images and we have this descriptive narrative that is supposed to show practices and how systems of provisions might have changed to get to those practices uh, but it is i think it's a very important question because we don't want to individualize um, what change looks like and and to be honest when we did our first version of these personas when we started describing their practices in 2035 it was very individualistic and we had to bring in those social change uh, initiatives to show how collective change made those individual actions possible. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. And Lenike, is yours also a question for Marlene and Ole? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, apologies about the strange name. I tried to change it, but it's a remnant of a workshop I was involved in <laughs> last week. And I, I, well, hopefully I can change it later. <laughs> Uh, thank you for knowing my name. I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, this is a really exciting uh, project, both actually. It, um, yeah, I'm so excited to see this work. And, and I've, I've already uh, uh, bookmarked the webpage of the Share City. And uh, we're also working also, actually with Mary. We were working on visualizations and, and how can you visualize systems, for example, um, it's only like really early work, but this topic is so interesting. Um, and I, I just, I think it would be really nice to share more about this. So maybe my, I don't really have a question, but more of an excitement about working on this more. Um, and I also developed a role play exercise. And this is an exercise uh, where I have an, an interviewer, a critical interviewer and somebody taking a role and, and also a list of questions. Um, that I can share because it, it, it works quite well. People are able to, to get into this role and when they do it, they have so much fun. It's really, really nice to, to see. So if you're interested, I can, I can send it to you, uh, Marlene. Yes, I'm very interested. Thank you. I know that um, the Wuppertal Institute did, some, did a role-playing exercise that actually was, uh, I participated in some eight or 10 years ago when they were working on their 2050 uh, yeah. lifestyles. And I saw the Minister of the Environment in the Philippines take on the role of a hair, Marianne the hairdresser in 2050. And it was amazing how he was able to put aside his own baggage and engage with this persona. It took a lot of time to get into the persona. Maybe two, two or three hours were given just to get into the persona, but mm. it works quite effectively. I'd love to see that. And I think others also. So maybe if you send it to us, Claire and I oh, yeah. will circulate it to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really a, a format that has been used already quite a number of times. So hopefully it works independently now. Um, then I had another like a remark from our experience is that indeed these scenarios should be messy, I think. 
uh, and they, they should have frictions in them. Otherwise, they just become utopias. And I think that there is a utopia tiredness or, or weariness maybe among publics that, that, that makes it maybe ineffective or maybe even counter effective. Like, okay, we're not going to, I mean, the world is never going to be like that. So it doesn't make it very realistic yeah. either. And how to make it messy is, is an, again, an exciting topic. Like if, if Jaco was mentioning uh, what are research topics, I think these are really interesting research topics. Like how to make it messy, messy in what way to complexify this kind yes. of scenario and, and still make it engaging and also maybe activating for, for others if they see it. Yeah, and one way we're trying to do that, but we haven't yet cracked the nut, is we're working with um, um, an engineer who is an expert on rebound effects in energy systems, and we're asking him to come up with what we're calling trade-offs. So um, the idea is that he'll he's going to come back to us and say things like, uh, it, you know, ten percent if ten if twenty percent of people in Geneva give up their car this much energy would be saved. But, you know, if 60% give it up this much, so to, to have yeah. some, a little bit more data, a bit more quantitative data around the trade-offs, I think that's one way of making it messy. But then the messiness to me is even how we tell the narrative and how we represent the story. And, you know, how, do we want to show those trade-offs in the stories where really we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but I, I, I do think it's important for it not to be overly utopic. I mean, I always say in my building, there are people who are introverts. They don't come to the, to the, um, uh, the neighborhood parties that we organize and, the, and people should be allowed to, to live lives in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what also can help, like in the in the interview exercise that I designed, I had to have one interviewer who is critical. Then there's one person who is enthusiastic about the future uh, practice and one person who is very skeptical about it. And that skeptical person brings in all these things that might go wrong. And, and that is also a way to complexify um, uh, this future. Um, and then maybe a last remark, because I, I thought, to have you also considered to have day in the life kind of more like a scenario that that you that somebody goes through a day or that that maybe a neighborhood goes through a day that's a great idea a day in the life yeah thank you noted um Jaco? Yes, that was also one thing that I wanted to mention that say slices of life storyboards uh, daily uh, day in a life can be a very good way to make it more tangible. And then you also come across tensions and possible rebounds. And one other way to get the uh, emphasize the diversity can be uh, say, say part of the diversity is in, in say the different uh, values uh, the different lifestyles that people have, and you can bring that in one scenario, then it gets messy, but you can also say, always uh, work on, on say, uh, alternative scenarios or uh, alternative uh, personas, so that you uh, put them in a package just to show the diversity, and, and that are very good inputs to, to discuss also on, on tensions or trade-offs. And I have myself a good experience with using uh, these kind of visualizations, a bit similar uh, as the ones uh, presented in the beginning by, by Anna Louise. I just cut them in pieces and I use them as input for to, to have this in group discussions and focus groups. And then you, because they are in the daily life, people are very capable of responding to that and having their views on that. Although then always from their personal values and the, 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 the views on the present more than on the future. I might just um, abuse chair's privilege a little. So I, I heard you saying your mention with engineers and I could see Yako also mentioned it in the chat like this working with engineers. There, there was a project we were involved in a while ago, Stepping Up, where we had, so one little pocket of researchers looking at everyday practices, but the majority of the team were engineers. And the, the way we developed scenarios was to almost put limits on things. So we were looking at water, energy, food, futures. And we use the engineering scenarios to put some like hard stops. So how much water is available? How much food can be grown within the UK? How much 
bioenergy, I think was the, the focus of the energy scenario. And then we were asking businesses, organizations and individuals, like, where do you see yourself in these constrained futures? And it was really interesting because it added that, that mess that's so hard to get. We're like, well, <laughs> these numbers are really imprecise, but we have deliberately constrained certain things. And when you kind of spark that conversation within a constrained future, it's not saying it's bad or good, but it's like, how are we going to make this work? And the, the kind of the depth and richness of those conversations between all these different businesses and organizations about how, how they would make it work and what they look like in the futures really got at that mess. And then the only thing I would share from it is that it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to pursue the messiness and scenarios because as soon as you've got it, you cannot get a reviewer to accept a paper. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, they want a nice, clean, rich scenario with your clear findings and your clear take-homes and the messiest your scenarios and your conversations get, the harder it is to submit a paper and actually get it through the review stream. It was, um, it was a really interesting experience for lots of reasons. But I think what we gained from it was the actual kind of interdisciplinary experience of trying to make some meaning out of that messiness. I think maybe one of our papers is called like making messy meaningful or something like that. There's there was a whole set of exchanges on actually how much use you can get out of mess in all these different features. Well, I I, I, I think I. I think I can I can uh, put a little plug in here for the new journal that we're launching with Dan, who's here on the call, and Stefan Valen, Consumption and Society, to say that we would we would uh, very much welcome messiness as a. Uh... <laughs> okay, maybe we found yeah. a new home for all of us. Uh, uh, add some I would there. also be interested to what journal you had this experience with, because I think if you go to uh, a future journal and and you can. Uh, include that in the methodology then I don't see a real problem uh, yeah. with that because it's not only messiness but but where you you could sell it as diversity and then then you there are many issues to be touched upon I think yeah and it, it, that it's it ultimately we ended up talking about complexity isn't everything about complexity yeah, right and yeah. so much of it it's not necessarily the journals um I think sometimes it depends whose desk you fall on right um that yeah that's sense. always if we were yeah, issue with, with, with reviewers and the background yeah yeah and mm -hmm. um, so we still have another 15 minutes or so for conversations ah um Renuka hello everyone I have joined late so I don't know previous uh, what has been to talk uh, like you have been speaking about uh, however I have heard about uh, uh uh, concept called twinning where you you were it is very similar to like what you spoke in uh, one day in a life or something like that but twinning you you adopt someone and twin with them and try to understand uh, how they have been uh, dealing with their problems and share if you have any solutions and uh, going through the journey of co-sharing or uh making yourself twin twinning with them and then uplifting to a level where both are same so uh, uh, that that could be an exchange of things uh, which are useful to each other so it could be twinning in a personal matter like individuals twinning between individuals twinning between institutions twinning between uh, countries and uh, like we have I think commonly heard about twinning of countries but we haven't heard about twinning of individuals and uh, institutions or businesses to support each other for sustainable futures. Thank you. And I guess, Renuka, thank you so much. And if you have a reference you can share with us on that or a website, that would be great as well. Uh, I do not have any uh, like uh, article or, uh, but I have seen in the websites, definitely I will find out somewhere. Uh, it, it has come to me like on many websites, they speak about uh, sh uh, twinning, especially those who are working for sustainable development goals and so on. So I will find one and put here. Thank you. Great. Shall we open up now, Claire? I guess we're having a general discussion now. And That's I would also love to hear Anna and Louise on this question of messiness and how to represent the future in a way that's not either utopic or dystopic. 
Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess in terms of our business as usual scenario, there were elements of maybe ideal type sustainable futures as well as uh, less sustainable elements. So in that, yeah, that first image, there's, there is some element of community garden, for example, but it's marginalised, it's on the fringes, it's constrained and it's surrounded by uh, the dominant car culture of, of the city scenario. Um, so, so certainly in that one, I, I guess the ecological modernization is perhaps the least diverse in, in the sense that there it is very dominantly technical in its, in its construction. Um, but I suppose, you know, the use of ideal types is not realistic, but it's there as a, a simplification, a deliberate simplification to um, not an example of, of an average in a sense. So in the, in the context what we were using them to, to start conversations about how these, these kinds of futures might occur. So we were interested to say, well, you know, what kind of policies do you think underpin the ecological modernization scenario happening? What facilitated, what enabled it? So we were using them not as representations of reality in a sense, but possible outcomes uh, dependent on decisions and choices and movements in cultural sense around uh, the development of, of those kinds of futures, like how could they happen um, as a means to get back to the present around how things are, how they are. I mean, I think that the participants in the workshop were kind of saying, oh yeah, business as usual is um, perhaps the most familiar, the most realistic to, to their experience, although they did say it was a little bit dystopic from the reality they were a bit more positive I think about the reality is that right Louise am I getting that yeah 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 um yeah and just following on from what Anna said is also um you know I think in in the workshop and in you know presenting these images in other circles and conferences and stuff I think the people seeing them are what makes it messy at least in the processes that we're trying to do so like you know we showed the um desirable future and one participant said like yeah obviously great but who pays for it you know so that opened up the conversation of okay what's what's the underlying processes here what's the complexities and the other thing maybe to mention is that um you know uh they responded very negatively to the ecological modernization but i have presented in other circles where people said that that would be a utopia for some people they knew or that they themselves you know thought it was good so you know, there's also a complexity there about who's, you know, someone's utopia doesn't look like someone else's utopia or someone might look at the desirable future and not see utopia, but see like a complex mess of all these people on the streets. And, you know, so I think that's, um, and then the final thing to say on utopia is, you know, when we showed the desirable future, like we, had, like I said in the presentation, you know, participants related the futures that they saw back to the present day. Um, and one participant said, for example, of, of the desirable future, you know, obviously utopic, utopic, but not undesirable. And then talked about things she could see already in the present day in her work that would lead to that future, you know? So even if it was idealized, it was, the, her phrase was something like utopia, but not unattainable um, and that we could achieve it. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's a, yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting discussion uh, to to have. So what I could add here is that say even the people that have this uh, more technology or engineering oriented uh, utopian visions, they will be pretty aware that when you put that in practice, that also get messy. But but that's the part they they do not like, uh, yeah, because of their views and preferences. And, and you will also see that with more community oriented that, that they are shown in a very ideal way. But if you then go to talk how that communities and groups really work, then, then you uh, need all kinds of mechanisms also to, to keep the balances. So maybe just one more thing is about, about say, uh, I, did, I did a project on gas futures. So that was not so consumption oriented, more on, 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 on the supply and the energy side that we had that as an explicit purpose in the project, we had to find that we wanted to span, say, the maximum diversity just to show people all the ways that, say, gas and energy futures could look like. And that was a really, say, uh, 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 very helpful principle to show this diversity 
although we did that in multiple images and, and but we made them with with say uh, q methodology so there was some underpinning or there was some some say uh, methodological uh, uh, clarity how we did that and and that was but it didn't give any issues uh, when 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 uh, bringing that to a journal because because the methodology was considered as sound and that was then the result of the uh, methodology but even there we missed some points because uh, it depends all on the statements on the inputs that you put in the queue. And so, so, uh, so some points we still had overlooked, so we didn't get a result on that back. Mary, did you want to come in? Hey, yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> really, really interesting discussion. Yeah, I was just interested to, um, to think more on, you know, to what extent, well, I know, Anna, you did the work with the young people around, you know, how the visions led to engaging with the different narratives led to changes in their own understandings. But to what extent uh, futuring work in this field has considered how futures can act as a, or visions can act as a stimulant for actual practice change um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, changes in people's daily lives. I guess that would require some kind of longitudinal work. Um, but uh, yeah, it really uh, came to mind when I was thinking about your youth workshops and um, how visioning can stimulate change. Interestingly, I did work with biographic methods which involve looking backwards over individuals' lives and found that that acted as a, a form of intervention in itself, that the process of reflecting on lifestyles and, and daily action and its evolution over time led to people uh, making commitments to, to make changes in their daily lives. Um, so to what extent does visioning do the same? Well, certainly in terms of the policymakers intervention, our, our intention was to try and see if that form of engagement would lead to more uh, or different forms of change than, than had been experienced for, for many years. As Jaco was saying, a lot of these issues re remain uh, in place from 10, 20 years, the challenges. So it you know, was our intention to hopefully uh, destabilize some of those things and get those participants to think about how they affect change within their local authority. Um, now, of course, as you say, the measuring the whether that happens or not, uh, given the long time frames that these kinds of changes happen over, is very hard to do in a scientific fashion to to follow through in a research context to see that. And we did talk a bit about that with the consensus project and the backcasting workshops. We have the, the an area paper which discusses this kind of issue of impact beyond. The context because you can be very inspirational in the moment and then you go back to your desk and you've got 20 million emails <laughs> calling for you to do x y and z and, and then suddenly it's gone like i mean it doesn't it this alone is not going to affect change but it's a means to create an intervention at least to start a different kind of conversation at least that's our was our intention um and yeah we're, we're still reflecting on the method and, and where you go from that what what is the the result of that now we're lucky enough to work with the local authority members of that workshop um, now with other interventions from the Shirsty project so the Share It Toolkit, for example, is being rolled out in that area, um, which is a sustainability and impact assessment tool for food sharing issues to demonstrate their worth to local authorities, but also to potential donors um, and those who donate food to their, to their initiatives. So it's not in and of itself sufficient to enact change uh, and certainly not a method in itself to map and follow that trajectory of change. I think we do need other methods and, and processes to do that. And I see it as a complementary method to, to some of these other experimental issues that, that are going on. I don't know, Louise, if you have different um, Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to complement what Anna said, um, also sharing from the youth engagement. Um, so in the post-workshop survey, we had asked them the question, you know, what other forms of engagement would you like? And we kind of taught it in the narrow sense, like, do you want more workshops? Like, you know, how could we engage with you differently? And actually, overwhelmingly, the students answered it in a different way where they said, we want to participate in community gardens. We want to learn how to grow food in our community and we want to be taught how to grow our own food. So they kind of saw it as um, how could someone it was really more practical based and they really wanted someone to teach them this and they wanted themselves to engage in community based on the workshop. So, I mean, 
um, you know, if the school was to respond to that or in future when people were trying to work on sustainability issues with young people, um, they've been kind of sensitized or made aware that food sharing is there. And I think if someone was to give them those skills, they really did seem um, even more keen than we kind of expected. So that's kind of a, a slight hint in the very you know, short term. And um, if that was responded to, maybe that would have some potential, like you say, to make these sort of lifestyle changes over the longer term. Thanks. Yeah, it's really interesting. It uh, really resonates with uh, some community visioning work we did in Galway, um, Transition Galway. And afterwards, we asked what were the next steps. And the, the result was producing a booklet of actual practical things people could do. Um, I can share that it with people if they're interested. Um, and uh, it was very much yeah, an emphasis on upskilling. Like we uh, had some skills based workshops that emerged out of the visioning. So it could be that like the need to kind of develop know how um, is part of this backcasting transition and, um, you know, um, you know, changing kind of the kind of material landscape to facilitate these, you know, forms of know-how to develop or the social material landscape. So that was definitely one thing that came out. So I'll share that as well. Thank you. Really Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, everybody, for such a fascinating conversation and two fantastic presentations. Um, at this point, I think we'll do two things. One, um, I invite everybody that says they've got relevant work or interesting readings and things like that to pop their links in the chat. We'll gather all of those and we can share them with the group. So do, do, do be brave. If you've got something you think speaks to the themes today that others will be interested in, please do pop a link to your own projects and papers. We'd be fascinated to see it. And then as is usual with this group, we, we don't have our next, uh, next seminar planned. This is an opportunity to wave a hand and say, you would be interested to speak to us. Um, so we can do similar format today. We would typically invite two speakers to come and speak together. Um, we share an hour and a half together and facilitate the conversation. So do, do please let us know if you've got something that you would like to, to share with us. I would like to dominate. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to dominate. No, I'd like to nominate. <laughs> I don't want to dominate. I want... <laughs> Sorry. I would like to nominate uh, Dan Welsh, who presented something recently at the European Sociological Association. So I'm not putting him on the spot because I asked him in the chat there if he'd be interested. And I just wanted to say there are two formats in the past people also could take an hour. And I think that's also a nice format. Lenica presented her talk, it was, it was a bit longer. I mean, I think um, uh, Anna and I had agreed that the topics were similar enough to join them, but it can also be just one talk. And I think that's very nice as well. So I, I don't know if Dan is interested in- Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested to uh, present and get some feedback from this group. Sorry to, to join so late. I think I have um, seen versions of both presentations. So I've got some idea what was what was being spoken about. Um, but yeah, I'd be very interested to, I mean, I am I would be really interested to get input on, from people on kind of where I want to go next with uh, that work and that data, because I'm in a sort of somewhat dif dif different position in that the, uh, I want to run some workshops, uh, but I want to run some workshops with people that do futures work. Um, and uh, engage with them with the data that I have from the mass observation research that I've done, um, which is uh, uh, the public's imaginaries of the future. So these are not scenarios; these are imaginaries, which you know, methodologically, anal analytically, uh, 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 we have established from the data so I kind of want to work out how so it's just kind of round the other way around so rather than taking scenarios to the public it's taking the public's imagination of the future to futurists and thinking what you might do with that or what effect that might have uh, what impact that might have or engagement with their practices and I think that uh, you know my interest is I'm primarily a sociologist of consumption and my a, a primary interest of mine there is to engage with uh, professionals that do futures work to around their understandings of consumption and how um, 
how social scientific understandings of consumption might sort of complement and, and engage in their work. So I'll be very interested to um, uh, get some input from people on that. And I just, I, I know we're about to finish, but just a very quick comment on the, uh, the conversation about impact. Um, certainly from my, I mean, the real value that I, I mean, this is perhaps a very obvious thing to say, but the real value that I see in, in all of this kind of work is that in the data that, that I've got, so asking people outside of any scenario situation to imagine the future um, uh, in relation to consumption is, it, it's very noticeable how difficult people find it to imagine processes of social change. And, um, uh, a, a surprising, uh, in a way, a, su a surprising result of our data that is, was that when people were talking about that in relation to technology, they found it easier. People found it much easier to articulate social change in relation to technology. But social change um, uh, uh, outside of that, uh, people find it very, very difficult to articulate. And so I'd see huge value in this kind of work in giving people the uh, technology to do, you know, uh, social technologies to to do that. Um, but yeah, thanks, Marlene. I'd be be very happy to to present at some point. Thanks, Dan. And we also have an offer from Yako in the chat. So I think the best thing to do there, Marlene, is we'll take this offline and arrange uh, dates and things with Dan and with Yako separately, so that everyone is able to grab a wee and grab a brew before whatever their next commitment is in their days. So again, thank you ever so much for joining us. This has been a really productive and interesting conversation, continuing a very productive and interesting conversation we've been having over the last couple of months. So, so just just take to take another minute, we usually just take a moment to fix the next date together because it saves us uh, terrible doodling. Uh, is it okay that we, first of all, when do we want to meet again? Do we want to meet again near the end of the year, like around mid-December, something like that, or? That's good for me. Okay. Yeah. And that would be good otherwise yeah. late November, let's say December is always getting I busy. would share Yakko's view, maybe the end of November, because everybody seems to try to do things in the middle of December and it gets Fine. a bit chaotic. So yeah. the week of November 29th, um, same time, same place, same date, Wednesday, uh, 10 a.m. Does it work? So that's December 1st, actually. Fine by me. Yeah, that's right. Great. So that's fine for our, yay, our next meeting is set. That's always good. And then we'll get back. So that's for Dan's presentation. And then we'll we'll loop in with um, Yako for 2022, early 2022, and um, Stephen and Max. Maybe you also want to present your food futures work. What do you think? Stephen has left us. Okay, Max is still here, but I think we're we're out of time. So maybe yeah, we can follow up and contact Stephen offline. Yeah, sounds good. All right, fab. Thanks ever so much for joining us, team. Enjoy the okay. rest of your uh, Thanks, Claire. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for sharing. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. That's a little joke.